Welcome to the Thunderbolts.info podcast for November 5th, 2012. We bring you all the latest news, information, and analysis from the electric universe, shedding new light on the mysteries that dark theories have yet to illuminate. Today on our program, we have with us a man whom I believe, and who many people believe, is responsible for some of the most unique and truly significant research into the life sciences in modern times. While mass media typically demarcate scientific controversies along narrow and arbitrary lines, such as science versus faith, our guest today is an original and independent theorist whose groundbreaking research raises new possibilities about the nature of consciousness and the evolution of life, possibilities that institutionalized science has not seriously considered for generations. I'm very pleased to announce we have with us today Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, whose research on such concepts as the morphic field and morphic resonance have struck a chord with both academics and laypersons around the world. Dr. Sheldrake's new book is intriguingly titled Science Set Free, 10 Paths to New Discovery. In this book, he offers a compelling challenge to what he calls the 10 core beliefs that most scientists today take for granted all of which have at their center a mechanistic view of life and the universe. We're also very happy to announce that Dr. Sheldrake will be speaking at the forthcoming conference entitled The Tipping Point in Albuquerque, New Mexico from January 3rd to 6th, sponsored by the Thunderbolts Project. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, welcome to the show today. I'm pleased to be with you. Now, I received your book on Halloween, and I found that reading your very dispassionate outline of what these core beliefs are of most scientists and the mechanistic worldview. I was surprised at the emotional impact that it had on me because when you outline what it is that the reductionist, materialist, mechanistic view of reality actually demands that people accept, it's a pretty bleak picture. And in some ways, it's astonishing even to people who intellectually are familiar with these concepts. Were you aware that your discussion could have that kind of emotional impact on people? And it, there really is this kind of devastating emotional effect when we realize that these dogmas have come to dominate the sciences. Well, I'm, I, I'm pleased to hear that it had an emotional impact. I, I mean, it's in a way, in my own case, because I'm thinking about these things for so many years, I suppose the emotional impact has been sort of spread over a long period of time. I don't, I haven't personally absorbed it all in the space of three or four days, which <laughs> you've done. Um, so I suppose that makes it more concentrated. But it is a staggering thing. This worldview is so depressing, so deeply bleak that you'd imagine that hardly anyone could believe it and stay sane. But actually, the trouble is that most people don't really believe it, but pretend to during working hours. And um, so I think that the number of true believers in this theory is very small, even though in public, the great majority appear to be true believers. I think the ones who take it that really seriously are actually a small minority. Most people only believe it for part of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned this uh, kind of disconnect between what the reductionist materialists profess to believe and what the paradigm demands that they believe, as opposed to what they're likely to believe at a personal level. And probably the most glaring example of that is this notion that consciousness has to be a kind of shadow or an illusory effect of brain activity. What are your thoughts on that? We have this very famous quote from Richard Dawkins that you use, where he describes human beings as, quote, lumbering robots. Yes, well, I mean, the standard view is that we're machines like everything else and that uh, our brains are nothing but genetically programmed computers. Um, but again, I don't think most people can really believe it. I mean, they like to think other people, these Dawkins may like to think that other people are machines with genetically programmed <laughs> brains. I very much doubt if he thinks he is. Um, he thinks he's a rational cre a person who makes up his own mind about issues on the basis of science and reason. In fact, his whole foundation is called the Dawkins Foundation for Science and Reason. 
But science and reason would actually be impossible if our brains were simply mechanistic systems with no free choice, which is what mechanists believe. Um, mechanists and materialists would simply believe what their brains make them believe. And it wouldn't necessarily be true. It would be just what they're programmed to believe. So I think it's actually a self contradictory belief system because the people who believe in it think it's true and yet they're only believing it because they've been conditioned to according to their own theory they've had no free choice in the matter well this is interesting because you're using the word believe in association with the ideas of a scientist and that traditionally is not an idea that we hear in popular discussions about for instance science versus faith science versus belief the premise is that the consensus theory of science has transcended belief. They're not offering belief, they're offering facts. So what are your thoughts on that? Does this have to be reaffirmed that scientists are human beings like all of us and their beliefs actually are beliefs? Oh yes, I mean that's very much what I'm saying in my book. The, the ten dogmas on which science is based are very much beliefs. Um, it's a belief system or a world view. And my point is that science is inherently not a belief system or world view. It's a system of in inquiry. And if we can liberate science from this imprisoning dogmatic framework, um, it will become much freer, much more fun, much, and we'll have a lot more new discoveries. Um, I think the problem with science as a belief system is that most people who believe it don't realize it's a belief. They just think it's the truth. They think other people have beliefs, but they know the truth. And I think this makes it particularly insidious because they're simply not, you, if you are not aware that you've got a belief, you can't question it. If you think it's just the truth, then why question it? So um, I think that makes it a particularly uh, pernicious and um, a dangerous belief system. So one of the points of uh, my book, Science Set Free, is to show what these beliefs are and how when one does actually question them scientifically, they don't hold up very well as science. Now, I think here in the United States, and I'm sure in many other parts of the world, we've been conditioned to have reactions to certain concepts and certain buzzwords. I mentioned the basic premises of the so-called debate of science versus faith. You present an alternative that offers new ideas contrary to the traditional assumptions of what would be called neo-Darwinism, the modern interpretation of evolution. And I think a lot of people, especially here in my homeland of the United States, might then immediately assume that you must then be arguing in favor of creationism or what's currently called intelligent design. Is that something that you've run into where people have these kind of preconceived assumptions about the narrow lines that a discussion has to follow? Yeah, well, I find that some um, uh, materialists assume anyone who opposes them must be a, a creationist or a believer in intelligent design. I'm certainly not myself. I, my own view is that the whole universe is evolutionary, not just biological nature. So in a sense, in, I go beyond regular evolutionary theory in, in stressing that there's this evolutionary principle in all nature. Um, and I don't really hold with the intelligent design uh, theory because um, the problem with intelligent design is that they actually share the same mechanistic assumptions as mechanists, uh, the mechanistic materialists. <laughs> they both assume that living organisms are machines. And as soon as you take the view that something's a machine, then if you're going to follow through the machine metaphor, then the machine must be designed, or machines we know about are designed um, in factory, uh, by designers or engineers, and then they're made in factories. And in the 17th century, this was quite explicit. The founders of mechanistic science thought the universe was a machine, animals and plants were machines, and that God was a kind of engineer who intelligently designed everything. Um, so, intelligent design is actually built into the machine metaphor. The mechanists and materialists then try to say, well, although, it's, uh, although they're machines and they have designs, the designs are made by chance through natural selection and chance mutation. Um, the intelligent design people say, well, you have to have an intelligent designer. Chance and natural uh, mutation. Chance mutation and natural selection aren't enough. Um, but you see, both of them share 
this machine premise. And I think that where they're both wrong is that we live in a world of organisms. The, the whole universe is like a developing organism. The Big Bang's like the hatching of the cosmic egg. Um, the galaxies are like organisms. Solar systems are like organisms. Atoms are like organisms. And so, of course, are living organisms like animals and plants. And the point about organisms, what makes them different from machines, is that organisms organize themselves, whereas machines are put together in factories. And secondly, organisms have their own purposes or goals. Uh, machines don't. If you get in a car, it'll go wherever you want it to go, as long as it's in working order. It has no desire of its own. Whereas if you get on a horse, it might easily have ideas of its own, as I've discovered myself when I've been riding horses. Um, and that's because it's an organism. And so I think if we think of the whole universe as an, an, an um, or developing organism, everything within it is, as organisms, then we can get away from this idea of an external designing mind. I think there's a creativity in nature for sure. And that creativity often behaves in ways that strike us as intelligent. But I'm not saying it's an external de designing mind. I think living organisms themselves are creative. We're creative. You know, animals are creative in the way they respond to challenges, especially dogs and chimpanzees and so on, mm -hmm. and jays. Um, so um, I, we don't have to say the creative is, creativity is somewhere outside all these things. Right. I'm speaking with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake about his new book, Science Set Free, 10 Paths to New Discovery. Now, I mentioned in my opening uh, this, what I consider a false dilemma of science versus faith, and you just mentioned the word creativity. We hear the term creator, often it's discussed with the intelligent design concepts, but the notion of life as a creative force, as it being imbued with this kind of natural uh, creativity that's just inherent in all living organisms, that's, that's really not something that we hear offered by either side of this so-called debate. What is the significance of the concept of creativity in our attempt to gain a better understanding of how evolution actually works? Well, I think what it says is that the whole natural world has a creative capacity. Evolution, in my view, involves an interplay between habits, because I have this idea that the regularities of nature are like habits, there's a kind of memory in nature, and uh, an interplay between habits and creativity. Um, and you see, what puzzles me most about this American debate between, you know, creationists and, and, and science. And I say American because we don't really have the same kind of fundamentalists in Europe. This thing is just not an issue. I mean, evolution is taught in schools everywhere in Europe almost entirely uncontroversially. I mean, this is simply not an issue. Uh -huh. It's a peculiarly American thing, this, this <laughs> debate. But the thing is that if you actually look at the Bible and chapter one of Genesis, uh, the interesting thing is that theologically, it doesn't say God designed the animals and plants. It says, and God said, let the earth bring forth uh, trees that give fruit after their kind and grass and herbs that give fruit after their kind. And let the oceans bring forth uh, life and, and, and fish and that sort of thing. So what it, in theological terms, if you read theological commentaries on this, what it's called by theologians is mediate creation. God doesn't directly create all the animals and plants. Um, he empowers the Mother Earth to give rise to them. So the point is that the story in Genesis chapter 1 itself uh, says that there's a designated creativity in this, the Earth and in the oceans which gives rise to life which then reproduces itself, which is more or less in a very, very ca encapsulated form what modern science is telling us too in the evolutionary story. So uh, this peculiar de de belief in God as an engineer who intelligently designs things isn't actually biblical. It comes from 17th century mechanistic theology, a kind of theology that arose in response to the mechanistic uh, theory of nature, which is still the dominant view within the sciences. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking again with Dr. Rupert Sheldrake about his new book, Science Set Free, 10 Paths to New Discovery. A moment or two ago, you used the term habit, and this is a very interesting concept that the laws of nature are not necessarily fixed. The prevailing cosmological theory is that 
everything began with a big bang and following that the laws of nature as we know them today were set. What have you seen in all of your study of the life sciences that leads you to feel that what we think of as laws would more accurately be characterized as habits? Well, first of all, the idea that laws of nature are fixed at the moment of the Big Bang is a philosophical assumption. It's not something that's proved by it. We can't go back to the Big Bang and test all the laws of nature then. Um, so it's just an assumption. And it's actually a hangover from the kind of platonic metaphysics on which 17th century science was based. The idea that God's an engineer or designer and makes up the laws of nature as mathematical laws in the divine mind. Um, so I, I, its origins are not something that's being proved, it's simply a carried over dogmatic assumption from an old world view. But since 1966, we've had the idea that the cosmos is radically evolutionary, uh, that it started very small and very hot with the Big Bang, and it's been growing and developing ever since. That's the standard modern cosmology. Um, now, it may have a lot wrong with it, but it, nevertheless, that's what most people assume. But in that, in that worldview, everything's evolutionary, so why shouldn't the laws of nature evolve as well? And in fact, I argue that law is a pretty poor concept because it's very anthropomorphic. Only humans have laws. And um, it kind of extrapolates our concern with laws onto nature. And in fact, human laws do change and evolve with time. The laws of the US today are very different from what they were 100 years ago. So um, I think a much better metaphor is habit. I think this applies to all things, not just living organisms, but even crystals. I'm saying that if a new compound is made for the first time in the laboratory, then uh, the, when it's crystallized again somewhere else, it will crystallize more easily because there'll be a kind of memory of the form of the first crystals, the lattice structure. And the third time it's made the memory of the first and the second, and so on. It will there'll be a kind of cumulative memory building up, so that things crystallise more easily as time goes on, and that's just what we find. Likewise, in biology, if you train rats to learn a new trick in New York, then rats all over the world should learn the same trick quicker, just because you've trained them to do it in New York. And the more that do it, the easier it should get elsewhere. And again, surprisingly, there's evidence that that actually happens. So what I'm suggesting is that a lot of phenomena in nature, the so-called laws of nature, are habits. The way that molecules and crystals behave are habits. The way that galaxies behave are habits. And the way that um, living organisms behave are habits too. And a lot of biological inheritance um, is carried by this habit memory principle, which I call morphic resonance. Um, it's not stored inside the genes in the DNA. And that's one of the themes I discuss uh, in my book, Science Set Free. Dr. Sheldrake, our time unfortunately is much too short today. I feel like I've watched um, a great trailer for an upcoming movie. This has been uh, a lot of fun, and I know everyone in our group is looking very forward uh, to seeing you in Albuquerque, New Mexico for the upcoming conference, The Tipping Point. Where can people go online uh, to see your work and if they choose to examine your, your papers and, uh, and your new book? Well, there's my website, www.sheldrake.org, O-R-G, that's Sheldrake, S-H-E-L-D-R-A-K-E. -E. On my website, there's um, the, all my scientific papers are there free of charge in full format. A whole lot of streaming audio and video, um, a lot of articles, um, and um, a summary of my book, Science Set Free, um, and various lectures I've given, including my Google technical talk, uh, which is one of the most watched things of mine on the internet. It's over 200,000 views so far. Um, so there's a great deal there on the website, and I hope that anyone who's interested will take a look. Dr. Sheldrake, we just touched the tip of the iceberg today, but I, I certainly hope we can have the chance to do this again uh, sometime in the near future. I hope so. Okay. Thank you very much for joining me today. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. And thank you, the listener, for tuning in today to the Thunderbolts.info podcast. Stay tuned to the Thunderbolts YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Thunderbolts Project. And you can always find us online at Thunderbolts.info for all of the latest news and information on the electric universe. Thank you very much.